Hello, I am very happy to have some time with Yvonne Hudson, whose one woman show on Mrs. Shakespeare has provided my students with some delightful material that investigates Shakespeare the man. So Yvonne, can you tell us a little bit about your motives for creating the character Mrs. Shakespeare and kind of what you hope your audiences will take away from their visits with Mrs. Shakespeare? Well, um, thank you for having me uh, work with you and your class, Dennis. This has been a joy at a time uh, with the pandemic and everything. I've been slightly away from all of this, so I really appreciate it. Um, well, I got really curious about Shakespeare the Man when I was in graduate school at the University of Pittsburgh and taking Shakespeare classes and was working actually at that time with the Three Rivers Shakespeare Festival that was um, there and part of the theater department at that time. So I um, found that the little bit of Shakespeare biography that we were touching on in the class piqued my curiosity and I wondered about who this woman was. So I went over to Hillman Library there in Oakland and I started looking and couldn't find anything. I couldn't find much of anything except some kind of nasty comments about her in criticism written by men. Um, and there was no foundation for it. People saying things like uh, she was surely the shrew that drew her away from Stratford upon Avon and that um, <clears throat> she just was not an influence in his life and work to much of an extent, which I found amazing because she um, was his wife and she bore three children. Um, and did a whole lot of other things in the course of her life because he wasn't there. He wasn't there as his parents aged and he wasn't there at home as a lot of things happened on the home front. So um, in conjunction with my curiosity, um, I was thinking I might do a solo piece about her and actually because I was doing public relations work there at the time for the Shakespeare Festival, um, that perhaps it would be handy because we would get a call off season and some nice ladies from a club would say, could you send Hamlet to speak at our lunch? And we would have to explain, well, Hamlet isn't here because we're off season and those actors come in just you know, to work with us for the summer. And I thought it would be a good promotional tool to have. Uh, that said, I couldn't get it together right away. I worked on another solo project and kind of used that as an experience for doing something like that for the first time. I wasn't majoring in acting, I was majoring in, um, theater administration and literature and a broader MA, much like the ones that people would um, follow if they were teaching, if they were doing secondary uh, and high school teaching. So I stayed with it. Um, I put together a piece that had a lot of Elizabethan song in it because I was um, studying voice at the time. And then I kept expanding it. Every time I came back to it, I changed it. Um, when I did, didn't have a guitarist any longer, I put in more sonnets and more monologues until finally I had a piece that was more a speaking piece in, in which I would interject a little acapella singing from sometimes. But what I found in that whole uh, journey was that I was still always curious about Shakespeare. There seemed to be always something new that you could discover uh, for all kinds of reasons. And I can share a couple of examples of uh, that as we go along in, in this conversation. But um, in a way, it was kind of a gift that no one at that time knew very much about her. Okay, good. Yeah, and I will follow up on that in a, in a, in a little bit. Um, yeah. Now, when you, uh, uh, my, I've already assigned for my students to watch some of your clips and, and some of your pieces, and uh, I shared with you the responses from those students. And I noticed in those responses, a couple of students mentioned that they had known that Anne Hathaway was older than Shakespeare, but uh, I was a little surprised. One of the students kind of said something like uh, she had assumed that uh, Anne must have entrapped Shakespeare or something like this. And oh. You mentioned a little bit of the, of the negative reaction. Um, but I'm just wondering, what were your impressions about the responses that my students shared? Uh, what were you glad that they noticed? And, and like, what further thoughts would you like to share about my students' interaction with your uh, videos? I thought they were very insightful. And I thought that they... Um picked up on some of the major points that I like to make that include, no, she did not entrap him. No, a woman who was eight years older than her husband actually wasn't unusual in those times. Um, and some of the other facts that I brought forward in my uh, 
recorded discussions, uh, they really seemed to appreciate and sometimes were very surprised by. They seemed also curious and also wondering why they didn't know that he even had a wife, which I asked my audience in my show, I say, you didn't even know he had a wife, did you? And half the audience says, no, we really didn't. Um, because she's not discussed a whole lot as an influence in his work or someone who was right beside him when he was working in the theater. She wasn't. Um, but what I try to imbue in the piece and what your students picked up on is that she was a country woman. She was someone who knew the practicalities of keeping a home, farming, her family were farmers, and that there were many things uh, echoing in their life and in his work from the setting in which they both grew up in Warwickshire and very close to each other, so close in fact that they believed that their families probably knew each other. So your students um, very much appreciated what I was shedding some light on um, and were glad that they were somehow enlightened <laughs> and took away, they obviously took away something new, um, it seemed, uh, in almost com all the comments they reflected that they learned something new and something that was pretty essential about this woman and uh, her relationship to Shakespeare. Yeah, that, that was a fun set of, of assignments to mark because I was given real high grades for people because they had so, so many good insights. Um, and I will have to I'll take some of the responsibility for the fact that my students knew so little about Shakespeare and that I really, uh, this is an English class, not a history class, not a biography class. It's not a class about what students feel about Shakespeare. It's about the text. That's how I'm approaching it. And so I've deliberately downplayed Shakespeare's biography because I think many of my students have been trained through high school that the thing you do when you analyze a work of literature is you look for parallels between the fictional work and the author's life. And that's, mm -hmm. of course, one way to do it. But we know so little about Shakespeare's life, I would be worried that people would if we spent a lot of time thinking about Shakespeare, that they would start with the play and they would decide, oh, well, because of Hamlet, Shakespeare must have had mommy and daddy issues or something like that. And, and I didn't really want to start with the plays and have them imagine Shakespeare, like what kind of man could have produced these? Uh, however, that's exactly what you did, <laughs> starting with this work and at looking at this work and asking your own questions that hadn't been asked before about um, uh, Shakespeare and that relationship. And so uh, can you give us an example of a detail about Shakespeare that you discovered, a factual detail that's really documented about Shakespeare or like his immediate environment, you know, life and times in Elizabethan England uh, that really helped you to shape your story and that surprised you? He was definitely someone who grew up working with his hands because his father was not only a glover, but I discovered uh, would have overseen probably the slaughter of animals for which they had hides, they tanned, and very close to the um, Shakespeare birthplace, their archeology span shows that there um, were pits which were filled with lye and they used to tan these hides that they made into gloves. So when you uh, hear or read Romeo and Juliet and he talks about, uh, oh, that I might be a glove upon that hand, that I might touch that cheek, he knew about gloves and they produced gloves that would have been sold to people who could afford to enjoy such things and, and, and dr to dress up with gloves even, not just uh, practical work gloves. So I thought that that was a, a really personal and interesting um, detail that shows up in the works that is directly related to what his father probably taught him how to do. Right, and certainly- but, and, and then there were other things like his, his father was the ale taster in uh, uh, Stratford, which meant that you would go to the ale house and literally, because they would wear leather pants, I always thought this was so entertaining, pour the ale on the seat. And then if it was good ale, um, you should stick a little bit, you know, to the, the bench when you go to stand up. So things like that, that were so like earthy and real about the way people lived and how they ate and drank and made things and were um, um, fending for themselves and, and making a living. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. I those mean, are, those are two of my favorites. <laughs> oh, that, those are great details. And certainly Shakespeare's popularity with the working class, uh, you know, he he wasn't just putting in 
erudite complex references to Greek mythology to show off how smart he was, he was also putting in fart jokes, you know, so the, the mm -hmm. fact that he appealed so broadly um, uh, he, he had to know the working class well in order to appeal to them that well, I think. And now your job as an artist uh, is different from mine as a scholar. Now, if your art helps people feel close to Shakespeare and helps them connect to his work, and, and then it's doing an important job. Um, but I want to peek a little bit behind the curtain and ask you, what's an example of a detail about Shakespeare that's in your creative work that you invented because it fit your story well. <laughs> maybe maybe it just sounds so right that you ought, that there might be audiences out there believing something about Shakespeare, but really it came from your creative mind. Are there a couple examples like that? Well, a big one would be that I decided I had to have a device through which she could find out about what he was doing because he went away and then he was gone for long periods of time and, and would have had little contact, little little evidence of what he was up to, if you will. Um, so I decided that uh, for one, the sonnets would be a wonderful way for her to explore uh, his feelings about her and her feelings for him. And at the same time, give me an excuse, a literary device um, in having her learn to read mm. so that she could actually call him on it or confront him with it if you if you would like to think of it that way when he comes home. So I decided that uh, her very um, precocious daughter, Susanna, who was thought to be fairly literate at a time when girls did not go to school. Um, Susanna married a doctor, so she married well. Um, encourages her mother to learn to read because Susanna's curious about in my piece what are in her father's books what are the what are those words um, the few books maybe that they had in, in their home um, including the Bible at that time so um, Anne learns to read for my purposes so that she can uh, explore a little more and would have a reason to be reciting some of the things that I wanted to feature in my piece. So the ulterior motive, not historical, but allows me to have sonnets and songs and soliloquies from the plays that she might not have ever seen performed, except maybe by her husband, as I suggest on the hearth, you know, for family entertainment after dinner, whenever he would come home. Um, that's not historical. She was more likely illiterate and might have been able to make her mark on a legal document. But I needed a way, if this piece was to help intrigue people about Shakespeare, and not just for the sake of me getting to um, use a lot of those wonderful words, which is a joy in itself, um, would allow me to introduce people to, in some cases, pieces they might know well, but turned in a different way or pieces they might not know well that fit my story. So I constructed a script with those items plugged in and it's been very convenient because sometimes I don't use the whole speech. I make it shorter. I may only have a half an hour to perform something that's been up to a 90 minute piece. Um, so it's practical in the sense of a solo show that can also be used for teaching or maybe a 50 minute class period. And on the other hand, it gives me some of his words to help her express her emotions in, a diff in addition to my script. Okay, thank you. And um, uh, I think the, the fact that Shakespeare often placed his heroines in misogynist patriarchal societies surrounded by horrible men who do horrible things to them, sometimes that makes people who are new to Shakespeare kind of angry at Shakespeare assuming that he kind of agrees with those demanding fathers and violent mm. husbands and strict rulers. And so I just ask, how do you, as an educated professional woman living in the 21st century, how do you kind of react to and work with the treatment of women that you see in Shakespeare's plays? And what are some strategies or maybe some role models within Shakespeare or you know, in his orbit uh, that might've been important to your own relationship with Shakespeare? Well, there are so many, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what some of them are. My take, however, had to be that 
he must have modeled these women in the plays after people he knew, his mother, his daughter, probably his wife. Um, I thought, well, what models would he have had for the, these women who are living in the country and raising families and putting on different roles? Yes, they had to be played by men or young boys at that time. But I, I found as I continually mined the plays and tried to look for what made them tick and what made those characters tick, I decided that he was not misogynistic and he loved women and he wanted to see these powerful, strong qualities of women brought forward, people who were resilient, people who would disguise themselves in order to help someone or get, get something they wanted. Um, and the more I did that, the more I was convinced that I was right. So that's, that's what I go with in terms of presenting these women uh, or bits of them in my piece and knowing that um, I, I just don't think it could be any other way. He did something that was rather remarkable. And when you think about it, um, his plays have a lasting quality that's because of the language and the poetry, sure, but because of also the characters. And as Harold Bloom says, uh, plays that illuminate the human character and that he, Harold Bloom says that uh, Shakespeare created the human personality. Mm -hmm. So when we take something like Freud and in, impose it on Hamlet, that's out of Shakespeare's world in terms of interpreting something. Um, while it might be interesting to look at it that way, and certainly there are Oedipus and there are certainly classical examples that you know um, have um, aspects that you'll find perhaps in some of Shakespeare's characters and that Freud even examined himself. But it really comes down to these people, you know, and, and what are their passions? What are their tragedies? What are their triumphs? What are their disappointments? What drives them? And, and that's what people do. So I just find the plays and their stories so uh, relatable. Juliet was certainly one of the first women that I met Zeffirelli's movie, you know, and studying that play in depth in high school. Um, and you realize she's, I think, really the strong one of the two in that title. And then one after another, uh, Viola, Portia, uh, Rosalind, who's so witty and charming and uh, not man manipulative, but really smart. Um, all of those women. Um, and women who are suffering uh, tragedies like Queen Constance and King John, whose speech I use to convey um, how you might feel if you lost a child. And I relate that to Hamlet and I can't imagine better words to express that um, about the room that's empty, the clothes that are no longer worn and maybe were left just as they were left when this tragedy happened, whatever it was. So um, it's just full, uh, the canon is just full of women who are extraordinary. Um, and I think like women he knew, and maybe also smart, better educated women uh, that he met in London. And also uh, the queen at that time, Queen Elizabeth was remarkably uh, educated and multilingual and certainly a role model, I think, for the women who came in the generations that just followed. Mm -hmm. She's amazing when you read about um, what, how she was educated and what she did and what she knew, that potential was revealed in that whole era and she was queen for so long. And that how she smart couldn't... she was not to marry his and lose power by you know yes. having male heirs to, uh, 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 in order to extend her power for as long as she did. Right. Was, um, wasn't she smart in that way? And she stuck right. to it. And uh, so the, I think there's a lot to be learned. And she was so public. People people knew that about her and, and young women and girls would have known that about her over so many years. Um, so that's, that's a, just a time of revelation and the time of change and the sea of cultural um, progress that Shakespeare was part of. Uh, there he was in the midst of all that. And then we had things like the King James Bible and the Bible being printed and uh, scripture becoming more than just a prayer book that you might tuck into your apron pocket. So there was so much being revealed to people during that Renaissance. 
Um, and there he was, that was in his lifetime. So I think that Anne, uh, despite her location out in the country, would have known, you know, things that were going on and would have been influenced as well um, about that potential. And she would have seen that potential for her daughters. Mm -hmm. So I try to depict that, mm -hmm. especially with Susanna, who wants to go to school and wants to read um, and wants to grasp these things that were still being denied to women. Well, good, thank you. And now my class includes creative writers, and you know, people who are dedicated readers, and we have student journalists, and we have theater majors, we have future teachers, and a few who just kind of wandered into the course. What would you say to young people who are almost through with their first college level Shakespeare course? What, what do they need to know about Shakespeare that they can carry with them, hopefully with a relationship to continue with Shakespeare? But what, what, what do they need to know? Well, I would always advise people to do, because I did this early on and it made it so much easier to learn more and read more and to memorize more, would be to, you know, find several sonnets, find a speech that you love and memorize it. Mm. Um, and I found in my own work, because I've also worked on some other solo pieces like the Bell of Amherst, that the fact that I worked with all this material, when I came to then learn and memorize something else, it was so much easier. And often when I do my show, people will say, how did you memorize all that? And I usually joke saying, I have no idea because <laughs> Like they don't teach you that in school, you know, it's not like you have a memorization class and some people are better at it than others. And everybody kind of finds their own way is what I've talked to other people about, uh, that your brain works and how you uh, memorize things visually or by lines or what the words look like, all kinds of tricks that people use that enable you to memorize um, much more than you might think. So, and I experienced this uh, reality myself when I performed um, here actually in Lawrenceville where I live. Many years ago, I came to Canterbury Place where seniors um, who are dealing with a variety of uh, age-related challenges physically, physical and otherwise, uh, were watching my show. And I thought that they just weren't, some of them just weren't there. I just didn't sense that they were with me. I wasn't feeling that energy, you know, and I, I kept going. But I could see within the audience that there were people reciting parts with me. Wow. And sometimes not the best known speech that would roll off of your tongue. Like I, I include Boldness Comes to Me Now from Troilus and Cressida um, and use it when Anne reveals that she's, falling in love and she needs to say something to him about what's happening to her. Um, there were people who were uh, reciting along with a, a rare sonnet or a speech like that. So when I talked to them and mingled with them afterwards, I found out, of course, some of them had been English teachers and they had memorized and taught some of these pieces and knew them well. So I always stress to people that um, the confidence in memorizing poetry, Shakespeare, whatever it is you might want, um, is priceless. And you take that with you for your life. It's so great to be able to recite something to someone, you know? So that would be one piece. I would say with Shakespeare and the plays, they were written to be heard. So while you might sit down and try to read them, that's not always the easiest thing to do. I would suggest listening to recordings uh, of different actors playing some of the roles. And then also, of course, to experience the plays in the theater, because then you have the other actor or player, which is the audience. And uh, that's, I think, very important. And the thing that the theater experience does um, is you could see the same play, of course, interpreted so many different ways. You know, a contemporary ver version of Hamlet, um, Elizabethan version of Hamlet, a Victorian version, all kinds of things will emerge in the interpretation of those plays based on when they're set. And there's nothing wrong with that, but um, something like Twelfth Night, for example, when I saw the all-male cast uh, led by Mark Rylance as Olivia, for example, on the tour of the Globe's production of Olivia, uh, of uh, Olivia and Viola, and that that the cast of characters um, when they toured Twelfth Night, that was illuminating because there you saw not a woman an actor who was female playing 
someone pretending to be male, but you saw a young actor, male, playing a woman <laughs> or playing a woman pretending to be a man and of like Victor Victoria, like it goes on and on. And that was so revealing because what it revealed to me in watching that was also the different kind of um, sexual relationships people might have had. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, uh, um, I'd love to keep talking forever, but- I could. <laughs> but yeah, uh, uh, I wanna again, thank you so much Yvonne for being part of this. Uh, I'm so happy that my students were able to see bits and pieces of Mrs. Shakespeare and benefit from your wisdom and intelligence and your creativity. So, uh, uh, so thank you so much. And, and just a final message to all my students. Um, uh, good luck as you power through these last couple uh, uh, assignments. I uh, hope to take care of yourselves. And again, thank you so much Yvonne for spending some time. So I'm gonna say, uh, I hope everybody has a, a, a nice final couple of days as you finish up this semester. And Yvonne, I hope that your future journeys will uh, include many more visits with Mrs. Shakespeare and I hope to stay in touch, okay? Thank you so much, Dennis.